I want to bring up our next speaker. I had uh, the opportunity to receive our speaker's bios and, and many other things. I had an incredible cup of coffee reading our next speaker's resume and thought to myself that if I could achieve in my lifetime what this next speaker has achieved over the course of his or just a quarter, I could die a very, very happy man. Dr. James Milgram is a former NASA mathematician, Stanford math professor, and the only true mathematician to serve on the validation committee for Common Core. A mathematician, a math analyst, as opposed to just being a math teacher. He refused to sign off that there were adequate academic legitimacy to the Common Core. And Dr. Milgram will focus on the failure of the core mathematics standards to live up to the claims of the Secretary of Education and the President and the resulting consequences for our country. Please help me welcome Dr. James Milgram. See if we can adjust this. Does that work? No, it doesn't because it falls. Okay, is that it? Ah. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> That's efficient. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's see. In 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 2009, I was appointed to the Common Core Validation Committee. And as was mentioned, uh, I was the only actual mathematician and indeed the only member of the entire committee which was, to, which was overseeing the development of one of the most important works in education uh, in many, many years. And I was the only one uh, with, a, with a PhD in content and not in education. Um, so I took it on myself to try to get the best possible document in mathematics. However, in the end, as has been mentioned, I could not sign off on the document that had resulted because it's not internationally benchmarked and indeed there's no research behind it. In particular, there is no guarantee whatsoever that any of these courses will work. The most dramatic of these, of course, is the uh, purely experimental uh, geometry course, which uh, the only evidence for that is uh, back in the late 1970s for a couple years, the Russians used, uh, developed a course very much like this. And it was so roundly condemned by the teachers, by the students, um, and in the, indeed by the whole country, that it disappeared after two years. So <clears throat> that's the only evidence that supports those geometry standards. And <clears throat> and you know, and so I was I was extremely critical and getting more and more irritated, frankly, because. I couldn't get them to show me any research. And, uh, you know, initially the validation committee had the authority to force revisions whenever we were really unhappy. So initially I was able to get some changes made. But when they saw that I was doing this, uh, the very first thing that the validation committee did somehow or other was to decide that we didn't have that authority to, to force revision. And so that stopped once I started making, getting changes made. <clears throat> so it wasn't that big a deal to be on a validation committee at that point. <laughs> and I, I suggested to people that maybe I'd be better off on the writing team. Uh, they wanted me nowhere near the writing team. So <clears throat> that's my history with the Common Core. And, uh, you know, um, let, 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 me, let me switch subjects for just a minute. Uh, 
there's a famous educational historian named uh, Diane Ravage, who, who was for a period of time the Assistant Secretary of Education. Um, and she has a, a book that's well worth reading, if one has the time, called Left Back. And it was published about eight or nine years ago. And <clears throat> she points out in that book that every 20 years or so, the education schools notice that our K-12 outcomes are not improving in mathematics. In fact, they, may be, they seem to be getting worse. They then say, we can fix the problems, and they present exactly the same programs and curricula that they presented 20 years earlier, understanding that a huge majority of our people will have completely forgotten what happened 20 years earlier, and the rest of us will be so old that we've sort of uh, gotten away from trying to actually fight this stuff. <clears throat> and then they say, this time though, we need to spend more money and everything will be fine. 20 years, spend more money. 20 years, spend more money. And the outcomes keep getting worse. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Albert Einstein's famous definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over, but expecting different results. So in California in the late 1980s and well into the 1990s, we had standards that, that pushed the most populous state in the country in the direction that the education schools were telling us was best. Of course, our outcomes became more, quite dis, dismal very quickly. In fact, the simplest, the simplest data I can show you for that is that the remediation rate in our state university system, by far the largest state university, university system in the country, um, started in, in, in 1989 at uh, 23%, and then shot up by 1997 to 56%. So well over half the students at the university that was restricted admission to the top 30% of the students in California, more than half of those students had to take remedial math. Okay, and, and that's, what we, that's what we were dealing with in California back then. Now, <clears throat> today, what I'm hearing is exactly the same concerns and exactly the same rhetoric that I heard 20 years ago in California. So, welcome to California <laughs> in 1993. And in fact, it's worse than that because the programs that we were getting rid of in California when we finally realized what the disaster was, those programs are back and they're back they were gone in California for about 18 years, but now they're back, and they're back nationwide. So again, welcome to California. And please, try to recognize that this is what's going on and try to look at what happened in California because it's got to be the model for what's happening in the rest of the country. <clears throat> So, of course, this is, the focus of all of this is, com is Common Core, and Common Core is the device which is bringing all of this to the, into the entire nation. And um, <clears throat> so w w what is Common Core doing? Well, Common Core claims that its, its intent is to correct the problems with the U.S. K-12 mathematics, and if followed faithfully, will make all high school graduates, workforce, and college ready. They say that, that they will, it will also strengthen the science, technology, engineering, math, that is to say STEM, pipeline, and rescue our economy by dramatically increasing the number of students majoring in STEM. Um, well, a critical component of that was to do what the um, 
uh, the high achieving foreign countries do and, and to design our standards around what they were doing. So <clears throat> they decided that, well, the most important thing that we notice about the, the, the standards in these foreign countries is that there are very few of them. And they're kind of very focused until sixth, seventh grade when they suddenly spread out because the foundation of this tree has been built solidly and people then can learn mathematics quickly and learn broadly. Well, that's the philosophy in, in, in the, the really high achieving countries. So how was this arranged here? Well, of course, the, the statisticians on validation, there were no mathematicians, as I said. The statisticians were statisticians from the education schools, but nonetheless, the statisticians clearly saw that the most important issue here was fewer standards. Okay, let me read you one of these standards. And this is a first grade standard from core standards. And it starts out, add within 100, including adding a two-digit number and a one-digit number. All right, well and good, that's clear cut. But I'm not done. And adding a two-digit number with a multiple of 10, not unreasonable, and a good place to stop, but no. Using concrete models or drawings and strategies based on place value, properties of operations, and or the relationship between addition and subtraction. Well, enough already. <laughs> but no, I'm not done. Relate the strategy to a written method and explain the reasoning used. Okay, fine, if I was in seventh or eighth grade, but here I am in, in first grade. You can't ask a child to do this. And, but I'm still not done. Understand that in adding two-digit numbers, one adds tens and tens, ones and ones, and sometimes it is necessary to compose a ten. Now I'm done. Okay, this is taken all together. This material takes up probably 70, 80 percent of the instruction in first grade in the high achieving countries. Somehow it's, it's in only one standard. Well, what are the other standards doing? What the other standards are doing is filling in every bit of silly mathematics that, and, ir and irrelevant and extraneous mathematics that various people in, this, in the state departments of education throughout the country want to see there. And that's the reason for that is, well, core standards is really a political document, and the most important point of core standards is to get large-scale buy-in. Well, everybody sees their favorite standard, they're going to buy in. And that's how it worked. You never, ever get 90% of the states in this country agreeing to a document like this uh, with any other approach. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to quote a few things. So, two minutes. Yeah, I'll just finish off with this. I'm going to quote two things here. Um, in March of 2010, one of the lead writers of Common Core uh, in mathematics, Jason Zimba, testified as follows. First, we have ex agreement to the extent that it's a fuzzy definition that the minimal college-ready student is a student who passed Algebra two. and that's verbatim. And indeed, you look at core standards in mathematics and they stop with a very weak course in Algebra two. There's a ridiculously weird course in Algebra one that I already talked about, uh, I mean, sorry, in Geometry, and then there's a weak Algebra one, and then there's a weak Algebra two, and that's it. That's all there is in high school. Um, and of course, uh, Zimba, when challenged on this by, actually by Sandy, uh, where, um, <clears throat> where she, she asks, um, 
you know, she asks, well, what about STEM? Um, this seems like a very weak definition. And so, and, and, and Zimba answers, it's not only not for STEM, it's also not for selective colleges. For example, for UC Berkeley, whether you're going to be an engineer or not, you'd better have pre-calculus even to get in to UC Berkeley. When pushed further, he admitted that these standards are designed as the absolute minimum you need, absolutely need, to enter a community college. They're not for selective colleges. They're designed for students that are going to community college. They have all sorts of flaws, no research behind them, and it's, it's, it's just a complete mess. There's no other description, and, and uh, I think you have to understand that. Thank you, Dr. Milgram.